My sincere pleasure is to now introduce Linda Galindo, who impacted my future. About six years ago, I was sitting in an audience listening to her presentation. And she was so good, I said to somebody, I got to get her on my board of directors. <laughs> and I made about 10 phone calls, and lo and behold, six years went by, and she served on our board of directors for six years. And now she's going off. And I said to her yesterday at her last board meeting, Linda, I hope you stay involved. And she said, oh, somebody's already snatched me up, because <laughs> that's how good she is. So you are going to be delighted by her presentation. So it is my pleasure to introduce Linda Galindo. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning. My name is Linda Galindo. I live in Park City, Utah, right near you, Kara. Aren't you in Colorado Springs? Um, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area originally, and from the age of seven years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. I made the decision. I knew where I was. I knew what I was doing, and I was very conscious. I want to be the person in the radio in my mom's car doing the news. I was like, how do they do that? How do they get like a person, you're seven years old, you're in the back seat, and there was something pretty dramatic going on in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time. Big news story, sort of uh, something very memorable, maybe like 9-11 for a lot of you. You knew where you were, you knew what was happening. Well, it was just like that for me, and I was like, I want to do that. And so I went into a college, broadcast journalism major, and became a newscaster, but I left school in just going into my junior year, took just the major, started sending tapes out, got a job, and really just it, school didn't mimic what was actually the business once I got into it. It, it was the, the who, what, when, where, why, be objective, do news reporting, and when I got into the business, Pretty exciting. I was a reporter, became a government reporter, all radio. That's all I wanted to do. Had a face for radio, knew it, and stayed in radio. But I became a reporter. Then I became an anchor, um, uh, very quickly became an anchor, really good at media. But about year six, news started to become a business. We started to be told by the sponsors, the people who pay for the advertising, you can and can't do this story. We're in the news right now, we're in trouble, newscasters, we would get a memo, you are not to cover this story about the sponsor. They're in trouble, someone at the leadership level has done something, can't do it. I saved those memos. I started to just put them in a file saying, this can't be right, this can't be right. I was in my late 20s at the time. And by year six, I'm getting a pit in my stomach about something I really loved doing. And I got into more production type things, thinking maybe if I get off the air and become a station manager, maybe if I go into radio sales advertising, something more creative, something in the production side. But I was in news, and I was being recruited, and right about year six, realizing, hmm, I might want to rethink this. So I called my mom, as I would do when I was in crisis, you know, you're young and what do I do now? And I said, you know what, I don't think I like this much. Uh, it's changing. The business is dictating what we can and can't do. And it's not what I thought. And this is what she said to me. Linda, it's a secure job and you have benefits. Stay where you are. But I'm not happy. Has nothing to do with anything. You have a job. So I stayed in it five more years. And on that fifth year, with more turmoil and change in the business that I thought was going to be this way, meanwhile, technology was changing dramatically. This is quite a while ago now. I've been out of it more than 20 years. But technology was beginning to change from big eight-track bulky carts and having to hand splice tape for your stories to everything becoming much quicker and much faster electronic ability to respond on news stories, et cetera. So had to keep up with that too. But still, I started to have yet another wave of, is this really what I want to be doing? Because leaders in news stories over and over and over again would finger, point, and blame. These are adults who run multi-million dollar companies. And I'm wondering, how is it that you don't understand 
You're accountable for these things that are happening. Why are you finger pointing and blaming? Have you seen any change in all the years you've been watching news, people blaming other people for the reason for things happening? It's, it's right back where it was. So really and truly, I said to myself at year 11, I have to get out of this. I've got to do something else. So what do I do in my moment of crisis? Call my mother again. And I said, Mom, this is it. Really, I'm getting out. And she said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I have this idea that leaders don't understand personal accountability, that they don't understand how to take ownership for what it is they're doing that isn't going well. And I'm going to start a consulting firm, and I'm going to be a public speaker, and I'm going to write about it. And my mom was really quiet for a minute, and she said, well, don't think you're moving home if that doesn't work. <laughs> this is 20 years later. Uh, now, uh, two teenagers and two books, one on, another one on the way, and an opportunity that I have day in and day out to think, eat, live, write my passion. The concept of accountability, personal accountability. And you know who's in the room with all of my dues paying and travel at Motel 6s and, you know, not these soirees you're seeing now. All that time, energy, effort, and risk. If the CEO of the company isn't in the room, I don't take the work. CEOs are asking me to come in and talk about what you will experience for the next hour. It makes the difference, and it is not for everyone. So I developed as an assessment, and the assessment helps me understand, should I go in there to begin with? Before the economic recession we're in now, the economic turmoil, this thing that has happened, and I have a lot of opinions about it, because it had a whole lot to do with not being accountable. Before the economic stuff started to hit, four out of 10 people who called me, mostly on reference, CEO to CEO would say, you've got to call her. She understands this concept. It really makes a difference in your leadership. Give her a call. Four out of 10 didn't make the cut. I'd do the assessment with the leadership team they had and said, you are not even remotely ready for this concept. All you're going to do is excuse and blame your behavior up to now. I can tell from the assessment. And so you've got to do some work before I'll come in, and I'll show you the work they have to do. You'd think it would be this big, complicated management model. It's not. It's basic behaviors you must have in order to reach that next level of excellence and high performance and sustain it, especially if you're publicly traded. Now that the economy is this way, six out of 10 are not clearing the bar. It's a very small group that will go through the rigor. There's usually crying involved. I'm not kidding you. There's a chapter in my book, and the, the beginning of the chapter says, my husband says my job is to make grown men cry. Don't fear, and women. They're in that top rank. Once they understand how much damage they've been doing by not being personally accountable, it hits them very hard. It hit me hard. So the concept you're about to see changed my life. And from that change and owning businesses and working for others, I came up with a way to deliver a concept, personal accountability, so that you have three things. If you're in the workforce, even as a student, lower stress, you're productive, and you're satisfied in what you're doing and engaged. So you're not all stressed out. You're really satisfied with what you've chosen to do, and you're engaged in what you're doing. Top to bottom, that's what you can get. Quality of your company's output is better, quality of your employee's life is better, but it is very, very personal. So you'll hear this throughout your, your career as a student, as well as a member of the workforce, in different ways. I'm just going to drive to the heart of it, because I only have an hour. By the way, I can relate a little bit to you. You're actually the most frightening audience for me, because you are at the cutting edge of what is to come. You're sitting in the most relevant space you could be sitting in because everything is changing and curriculum has to keep up. So whatever you're learning has to keep up. I am terrified of becoming irrelevant. So I'm getting my college degree now. 
I'm in my uh, Bachelor's of Business. I'm going to finish in 2000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things keep happening that, you know, it's funny to watch my cohort too because they're aware that I have a couple of books out. One is called Way to Grow. And that was kind of, somebody said, that's not a book, it's a pamphlet. Shut up. <laughs> and this one was published by Wiley, Josie Bass Wiley, the largest independent book publisher in the United States, oldest and largest. And then they, the Pfeiffer division of this company took on the training materials. And this book I just presented to David Costello, the outgoing president of NASBA, with it, a copy of it in Chinese. It was translated in Chinese. He wrote the foreword to the book. So it's moving along, as are the training materials. And I'm writing the third book now. I'm getting into the financial wealth management industry, talking to a lot of CEOs of insurance type based organizations, because accountability in those kinds of organizations and all of us having good financial awareness is becoming very important. So I'm getting into that market as well. I have an amazing, amazing life because who's in the room when I talk most of the time is CEOs. What would I prefer? This. And the opportunity that I had in um, NASBA with the Center for the Public Trust, could, you could not have paid for that. What I learned, who I met, what I saw, and then having a chance to meet students as well. Favorite, most favorite of all. From here, my oldest daughter, Leah, who's sitting back here, and I are going to Southern California. She starts her college tour as she goes into um, searching for what she wants to be doing as she goes into her senior year. It's a privilege. And going with students and seeing the world from their eyes, it's always a privilege. So speaking of seeing from your eyes, how many of you know there is an arrow in the Federal Express logo? You know there's an arrow in the Federal, you know it. So don't look at the end point here, just look at the two, the, the FedEx part, the purple and the blue. How many of you know and where the arrow is? Raise your hand. All right. So there are some who do not know. Is that right? So raise your hand if you don't know there's an arrow. You don't see it. Don't be shy. OK. So some of you know and some of you do not know. For those of you who do know, I want you to tell the people who don't where it is so everybody in this room is clear where that arrow is. Don't stop until everyone knows. If you still don't see it, the person explaining it didn't do it well. Get somebody else to show it to you. Take full ownership for yourself, full responsibility and accountability, and know where that arrow is. Does anybody still not see it? You have to be honest. Does anybody still not see it? Omar, you got it? You got it? You have the I'm not sure look. Everybody got it? Yes? All right. So in between the E and the X, just so we make sure everybody was looking at the same place, Jen, Jen, right there. It's right there. Yes? Whoa. Was that good? Thank you. I feel so much. I did, that reminds me of a header I took in the airport. <laughs> Another story late for a plane. It was fantastic, but it ended with, ma'am, is this your shoe? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, everybody's got it, yes? Do you think you'd never see it again? So from now on, when you see the FedEx logo, do you think you will never see it? You're always going to see it. You're going to be sitting in the back of uh, the back of it. There'll be a truck in front of you in your car, and the person says, "Do you know there's an arrow?" And you say, "Wow, I never saw." It. Oh, yes, you change their life forever. <laughs> it's like somebody showed me something I never knew was there. It, it's not life changing, is it? It's not life changing. It's fascinating. From now on, you will be you will not be able to not see it. You will always see it. And when you see the big, huge one on the truck, it jumps out at you. Some of us take it for granted. I don't remember where I learned that was there. And some of us are like, wow, at dinner tonight, I'm going to be so interesting. And you could get a little 
you know, the envelope, the FedEx, go see if they have FedEx here and show people. And you say, I showed you something you didn't know. There's something about showing people something they didn't know that is just interesting or actually life-changing that is leading. Now, what's interesting about the logo, and if you look, you talk to marketing students and branding and those kinds of things, art, graphics, you learn that it's the use of what's called negative space. And if you took everything around it out, you would not see the arrow. So you have the opportunity, as do I, this has nothing to do with where we are in our careers and choices, of always deciding how we show up as that arrow and where we're pointing. And it is context that gives us that. The context is what, what is around us. We shape that. And so every day I stand for being personally accountable, for teaching personal accountability, for shifting people's mindsets so they can never not see it again. And so lots of times when I get into organizations where I have the chief financial officer and his whole staff in some organizations, the financial department is 900 people. They are from a policing, regulatory, you can and can't do this, where's your expense report, this form isn't right, as opposed to, this is probably one of our most important endeavors, and it's important for you to understand, so I'm a resource, not a policeman. I want you to understand. I'm not just emailing you for a report, this is a relationship that works for all of us. So there's lots of components to not only doing, of course, what we do well in our skill set, and what we go to school to learn in our skill set, for me, how to operate the microphone and the board and the timing and putting commercials in, all those things I had to learn. But on top of that, 99.9% .9 of it over time has been relationship. I am totally, personally accountable for the quality of the relationships I experience. I am. I have 100% of that. Now, why is a book called The 85% Solution? Because what we found in the years of using this validated assessment, if you can get to 85% ownership and keep it there, you're gonna have high performance, low stress, productivity, and job satisfaction. You're gonna be able to create a high performance team of people. You're gonna be able to sustain low cost, high quality output. That assessment is so accurate, I can tell the day, the time, and the minute something's going to blow up for your team over what, depending on your strategic plan. If that assessment doesn't hit at least seeing yourself as 70% responsible, you're not, you don't even have a viable operation. It's going to cost you too much. I tell investors, don't go near it. So it's a really specialized focus. I always know where that arrow is. The assessment shows me, or I can't see it at all. And if I can't see it at all, I'm not going in there because those people are just mean and they're flailing around and blaming each other. So, your question to answer for yourself is, what are you committed to and what are you accountable for and who are you at your core? Who are you? Who are you at your accountable, responsible, empowered level? Lots of people don't give this any thought. I'm entering into organizations where they've given it no thought whatsoever. People understand personal accountability perfectly when something works. I did that, my A, my paper, my group, my department, my team, my company, I did it, we won, I'm it, here. Doesn't work, I told them it was a bad idea, that teacher wasn't clear, they, were the, they start backing off. A high performance individual doesn't change their definition of personal accountability depending on working or not working. So when you show up for the job interview, when you find the thing you're passionate about and want to do with someone else, you show up as a responsible, accountable individual, period. And I don't care if you had lots of hard opportunity. I learned from those things, and here's how you will benefit from that learning. That's ownership. It's not the story of what happened. So really showing up as somebody who owns the experiences and what's happened without fault and blame and guilt demonstrates who you are at your core. So I want to change your view of yourself and your, how you see personal accountability. I think, I know, I live that the adults today, the people that are in the generation of leadership have let people coming behind us down. We've let, it, we've let this down.
because we're not being accountable for what we've created without fault and without blame and without guilt. You can't move on to solution. The, the view has to change. So thankfully, I get called a lot. People know that we are in a pandemic of a lack of accountability, personal accountability. Corporate accountability allows the law to say, if you vest all of your accountability in your corporation, there are no people to hold accountable. It's a game. But it is t sucking the soul out of our ability to make change. So I'll play the game, but I'll also be personally accountable. They're not mutually exclusive. So in changing our view, some of us will just say, you know what, I just want to get through school, get that job, and start you know, paying back my student loans. And then get the job and get the next position, and get the next da da da. So one of the things that becomes critical, and I'm doing this with all CEO clients right now, is getting clear on what their definition of success is, their professional definition of success, not their goals. I don't want to know how much money you want to make, how many millions, how many new products and divisions you want to launch. You, CEO, in your chair, you, vice president, in your chair, what's your definition of success for yourself? And it's stunning how many don't know. The world's changed so much, they've lost sight. The compass is spinning. An assignment when I'm doing executive coaching is, here's the professional definition of success exercise, and I want you to fill it out, and then we'll have our second coaching. Clearly, 50% at least, I never hear from them again. It's too frightening to sit down, stare at a blank piece of paper, and say, what I started out with is no longer available. What am I going to do now? That's happening a lot with technology changes, with workforce changes, with ec economic changes. People have to reset their compass. You are totally personally responsible, as am I, for success. But you better define it. And it will change. It's a moving target. So that exercise that we do, defining professional success, what is it? guarantees you will be successful. But it is a very scary exercise. It's not for everybody. But you sit down and you walk through, as a student, what's your definition of success? As a teacher, what's your definition of success? As a workforce member, what's your definition of success? As a uh, child with your parents and your aunts and your uncles and your cousins all rooting for you to get your education done, what's your definition of success? As a community member, I had a definition of success as a board member for the CPT, and that's what drives me. So it's, it, it's critical. Activity is not results. That's what I have to teach organizations over and over. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Yeah, but what are you producing? So busy is not the same as successful, and busy is not the same as results. Now, sometimes in your life, you're going to get a hit in the head. And that hit in the hand is going to come because you didn't expect lots of things. It'll just be coming along and you'll say, wow, I didn't know that. And sometimes you'll be in training because your company brings you through training. And somebody will be sitting next to you going, are you listening? Because this is for you. You should be listening. And they'll hit you in the head. Sometimes you'll be the person hitting the other person in the head. But one way or another, how we learn unfortunately tends to be when we're in most of our crisis versus it's going along and it's a nice neat track but the learning is in the crisis better if you have a definition of success and start making things happen instead of letting things happen to you but either way i've had great teachers who've knocked me in the head and i've become a great teacher knocking others in the head it's not a bad gig if you can get it but in the, in the end, as uh, you heard, very first thing, Lisa saying, something I heard shifted. I am now working with a 28-year-old young man. He is going to be a game changer. He said to me, I want you on the board of my company. He quit a $250,000 a year job as an, a, a rising star executive in an organization for real. And he said, I have to do this thing. Linda, I want you on my board. And I said, I'm on another board. I've got two teenage daughters, still like my husband a lot, want to spend time with him. <laughs> so no, I'm not going to, I only do one at a time. He had me on some kind of radar. The day I was done with CPTs on the phone, are you ready? 
because we're going to, yeah, you can be on my board now? He's got me. And this, uh, he is going to be a name. No, it's a, it's a privilege to see somebody. But I did the same thing. Took huge risk, wasn't exactly sure how I was going to pay for things, and then so, had a lot of peanut butter in the early days. But it was a lot of risk to get out of something I knew and was being recruited to do, to do something I had passion about and really wanted to do. And actually wasn't all that sure. Didn't have a whole lot of help. Now I understand how to support this young man and what he's doing. And it really ticks me off he's only 28 years old. But I'll get over that. <laughs> so answer this for me. Individuals carry their success or failure with them. It does not depend on outside conditions. Individuals carry their success or failure with them. You know, I think there's a handout, and it's probably in your binder, and it has this on it more than likely. Is it on there? It is. Okay. So it's the second page of the handout, right there near my lovely picture or books or something. Okay. So there it is. Individuals carry their success or failure with them. It does not depend on outside conditions. Do you believe that? It's the interactive part. I want to know who put out the lime green memo. <laughs> it's kind of cool over there. This is the pattern side. This is the lime green side. I'm loving this. OK. Do you believe it? Yeah. All right. If I gave you 0 to 100%, Cornelius, how much is up to you as an individual? How much is outside condition? If I gave you 100% to work with, how much is up to the individual for success? And how much is outside condition? What would you say? Put a number on it. Yeah, James, there's one in every group that knows, well, that's the book title. It must be 85. <laughs> okay. All right, so if you just took it for living your life, how much is up to the individual for success? The, rea the real world. Well, it depends on what you say success is. It depends on what you say success is. It depends on, that's a big, people will say, and I do this in all manner of groups, CEO through, well, what do you mean by success? My answer, what do you mean by success? Well, I don't know what I mean by, I think mostly I'm not sure. That's a problem, one. If you have success clearly defined, how much is up to the individual and how much is outside condition? What would you say? 100%? So think of all the investors who took out mortgages, signed on the bottom line, put their houses underwater, borrowed more than they had, spent more than they had. How much was up to them and how much was outside condition for a successful interaction? What would you say? 100% them? What do you think they were saying, though? It's not my fault. Wasn't my, not my fault. Who did they have to blame? The bank. The bank. The bank did this to me. Did you have a pen in your hand? Yes, did you sign it? Yeah. How many of you go through, even here, the, the, you, you sign up for the internet and it says la, 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 la words, and then I accept. Do you read the words? You say, I accept, right? And then they said, oh, it said we could go into your bank account and take all your money. There's tons and tons and tons of things we sign and accept. We just got a free little card from T-Mobile that said, thank you for your business, here's a $50 card. You can use it just like a credit card, except ATMs and da, da da Turn the page over. The smallest writing I've ever seen in my life, you actually have to get a magnifying glass to read it. Full eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, conditions of use. The less personally accountable people are, the more laws and rules you need. Does that make sense? So one person in a company downloads crummy material from the internet that really don't do that. And what does the company do? When one person does it, they what? They block certain sites, but what, are the, what does some department do? They block sites. IT's got to block sites. You're going to get a policy. Somebody abuses the expense thing. You're going to get a policy. Low accountability, big policy manual. People not saying, bad idea, but it's just me. I'm the exception. A great example of being the exception. How many of you use your phone and drive? OK, when you have teenagers 
and they're getting ready to drive, how many of you want them using their phone and driving? Yeah. So I had bumper stickers made that say, hang up and drive. My teenagers are going to be driving. Do I want to be, oh, draw, you know, text, text while you're driving, you know? You're the exception. You're exceptional. In order for me to have them do what I expect, I have to demonstrate it. I have to be the example of it. And all of us think we're an exception somehow. So hang up and drive right there on my bumper sticker. My Lexus, it's on my Lexus. I put it on the car right there. And it's like, people will stop me in the parking lot. That is so great. I love that. And I reach into my car and I say, here, I have one for you. Would you like to? No, that's OK. <laughs> no, that's good. I, but I think that's good you're doing that. And I said, well, why don't you want this bumper sticker? Help us. Five teenagers died in one summer in different accidents from the use of cell phones and, and all these things you hear. My husband drives a bus, sees all kinds of near misses. No, I don't like to put things in my car. Oh, I made it a window cling. <laughs> no, that's OK. You know, who's the bumper sticker for on my car? If you drove past my car and saw me on the phone and you just passed the hang up and drive, who's it for? Is it to tell you how to live your lives? No, it's for me. So the list I'm going to give you that will make you ensure that you are successful and a leader in anything you choose to do, same thing. It's not for other people. It's for you. If I'm going to live it, now I go and rent cars, I'm personal integrity. I could be on the road and my kids can't see I'm using my phone and driving. Personal integrity says I'm not going to do it whether you're watching or not. That's personal accountability. It's hard. It's hard. And it doesn't get rewarded. Somebody doesn't walk up to you and say, excuse me, I think the way you don't use your phone is fantastic. Wow. It's a personal choice to do it. But I take a stand, a very visible one. Someone yelled at me, how dare you drive around telling everybody else how to live their life? I said, it has nothing to do with you. Text and drive all you want. Use your phone. But would you put a little light on the top of your car so I can see what you're doing? So that I can anticipate and respond? So I'm not telling you not to do it. I just like to know what you are doing so I can react. Total personal responsibility available to me, taking stand. Let's say you're the person in the surgical suite getting the surgery. You're on the table. Hope you never get in the situation. I work in healthcare a lot. And you're on the table, and they're going to put you under with the anesthesia. And before they do that, everybody who's going to touch you, slice on you, take things out of you, put things in you, you get to ask them with eye contact. On a scale of 0 to 100%, how much personal accountability are you taking for this being a good outcome? What answer do you want to hear? You want to hear 8515? I pretty much mostly got the instruments clean because they reward us for starting on time. I wasn't quite done with cleaning this stuff, but we're on time. You want to hear 100 zero? For everything you touch, do, get up in the morning, cross the door sill of, your mindset closer to 100 zero than not will mean you're going to stop and think a little harder. What do I need to be clear about before I start? And today, because we don't do that in healthcare a lot, we have all these processes and procedures. They hand you a pen and say, please sign where we're going to operate. Because we have wrong side and wrong side surgeries all the time. Please stop. It's a, it's a requirement now, surgeon, and say time out, and everybody announce exactly what we're here to do. Full account. We're do, trying 100 ways from Sunday to get people so that you don't say, the surgeon's saying, while I'm operating on you, these financials were sure scary. I've got to get my volumes up. Or the nurse thinking, my feet hurt. Or I'm afraid of the surgeon. I'm not going to tell him it's the wrong site. We have that all the time. That's what's on people's minds instead of, this is where I want to be. Everybody has great skills. The surgeon's supported. I'm keeping count. We're on it. I feel a lot more confident now that I know what the surgeon expects. It's in people's heads. I'm here to tell you it's in your head. You see it, just like you see the arrow. You have to act on it. So simple things, simple things, simple things, not a complex model, are really what change entire cultures. So the culture of uh, infection in hospitals that spreads rapidly, 
what a, an infection control person does all day every day is says wash your hands because leadership and self-deception highly recommend it by the way if you ever have a chance to watch or read leadership and self-deception do it it was when they realized they wanted something in their environment to stop and it was carried by the leaders it was carried by the leaders it can't be us we're in charge and everybody was saying it's you and they're saying it can't be and finally they were convinced they were the problem had to do with hand washing simple thousands and thousands of lives were saved because of one simple step leaders took and that's almost always what the case is so you're going to enter a world of legal accountability very transactional you tell me i follow rule things are good where I want you to get good so that you stand out is personal accountability and it's, tra it's transformational. I thought I was 50-50, 50% up to me, 50% outside condition. I'm 100 and I have 100 and I'm never gonna use somebody else as my excuse not to be that 100%. When I come to a conference like this, I'm invited, I'm nominated, but do I walk in saying, and I'm gonna own this experience fully or I'm gonna wait and see or what is this? I'm going to be clear so I can get all the questions answered and take, I get sent to a training when I'm in a, a company. What is this about? What are the expectations of me? Instead of, well, why are you here? An email sent me. Very different. You go in owning 100%, get 100% out. You get in and get out. You get out of it what you put into it. So personal accountability is transformational. How much is up to me? How much is outside condition? What am I accountable for? When will I keep up? In legal accountability, it's just tell me what the non-negotiables are so I stay out of legal trouble. What do I have to know? If you don't tell me, it's not my fault. What will I be held to account for specifically? I won't take on anything else. How often is it going to change? And how am I going to keep up? What things are you going to provide me? The personal accountability says, when am I going to keep up? That's my responsibility. So it's very, very different. All you need to keep in mind about this bunch of words is legal accountability and personal accountability are two different planets. You want to be on the planet that stands out. You get your feet on personal accountability. You will stand out. It's rare. It's rare in my leaders. It's rare in my vice presidents. It's rare in my managers. It's rare in the workforce. It's rare in society. We're, we're getting to a catastrophic point if we're not already there with people finger pointing and blaming. We're, we're churning. So it's a continuum. And it, it does start to say how you're going to talk about things. If you're closer to the 100, your language is going to change. At zero, you're going to say things like, they put me in this position. Closer to the 100, you're going to say, I accepted this role. In the victim position, you're going to say, the teacher wasn't clear about that. When you're in this position, you're going to say, I didn't ask clarifying questions. I didn't get to pick this loser group of people doing this paper with me. It's not my fault. I'm going to sit down and get a clear agreement, and the people who don't participate are not going to have the opportunity to share in the grade at the end. I'm going to get clear about that. I'm in this position right now. That when you have to do it with a group of people you didn't pick, you have to do it with a group of people you didn't pick. Welcome to the workforce. <laughs> you are getting a bird's eye, absolute experiential thing. I did not pick you. So the victim will say, I inherited this group of people. The change agent will say, I accepted this role in exchange for understanding what I've got to work with and I'm going to give, put my hundred in. I'm not using your, use my excuse not to have my hundred. But yes, it will, it will still happen when you get into the workforce, but you are not a victim of that. You accepted it. It may have been uninformed consent, but you can be a change agent if you don't devolve back into it happened to me. So you got accountability. You can't mandate accountability. You can only demonstrate it. So CEOs say, oh, bring that into my company. I want everybody to understand personal accountability. I want them all to be 100. I say, it has nothing to do with them. They're doing what they see happening at the top of the organization. So let's see what's happening at the top of the organization. I'm going to put you right through the quiz. 
look at your handout, is the very first thing on the first page, the behaviors. Do you see talk to, not about? See it? Okay. So what I have them do is I say, uh, you can't go in and say behave like this. Let's see how you're doing. And this applies to you as students if you accept roles in the Center for the Public Trust student chapter, any leadership role you take, anything you're involved in, see how much of this applies. The first is you make sure you talk to, not about. So you are not, if you talk about someone behind their back, then your character has now been exposed. Does that make sense? It is so fun to do that. But when you're in a professional environment, it tells the whole story. Can't be trusted. And that I want you to know, if we work together, I will always talk to you, not about you. That's tough to do. But you are known when you get in the car and you're driving back from something and you say, oh, did you believe Linda? Oh, it was now, if you say she was fantastic, phenomenal, best thing I've ever seen, that's not talking about it. That's good. Do it. It's the gossip thing where you're undermining someone else, and especially if you do it without the other person never meeting the person you're talking about. In an organization, it's a killer. So you want to make sure I talk to, not about. And then I ask the CEO, on a scale of one to five, one being, man, we do that a lot around here, to five, we're really good, we're great, we're excellent. I ask them to rank how they're doing. The second one is no meeting after the meeting. Do you know what that is? Meeting after the meeting? You're in that, James, you're in the meeting, and then what happens in the hallway after the meeting? Talk about what happened in the meeting. And st I didn't agree with that at all. Why didn't you say something? Oh, I saw someone say something like that two years ago, and they went in this other room and never came out. <laughs> this happens at the highest levels of our organizations right now, that people stay silent. And then in the hallway, the parking lot, the stairwell, they're starting up and I'm like, this is high school. It's not even college. This is, can you please have an adult conversation? Raise your hand, express your point of view. But you also have to be careful that you have excellent communication skills because if you raise your hand and you say, I think that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard and you're stupid. They say, oh, well, thank you. Appreciate that. No, tone. Do you know people who talk with the tone? The tones is what you're really hearing. They're calling you a name without calling you a name. Yeah, that's really what they're hearing. So oftentimes when someone says, oh, three years ago I expressed my opinion and they said I was too aggressive and too, they say, you know, so say it the way you said it at the time. And they had a tone. If you're not sure you have a tone that's problematic, ask at home. For free, you will get feedback. You don't have to go through executive coaching. You go find out from people around you, how do I come across? And then you'll find, so you gotta be able to communicate that, no meeting after the meeting. What's the third one? Use clear agreements. So all these things that are on this list, if you want them to start using them, you can email me and I'll send you all the word forms about all of this. Linda at lindagalindo.com. Linda, I want your forms. Clear agreement. We're gonna sit down, we're gonna do a project together. Let's have a clear agreement. What's the next one? Meeting agenda clarity. Oh my gosh, stick a pencil in my eye. Meetings are so boring sometimes, especially meeting after meeting after meeting in the workplace. If you get to that place, have an agenda. So in, in the high level organizations I'm working in, I say, I'm not going to any meeting if there's not an agenda and I'm not clear. What are we doing? Discussing, deciding, what are we doing? So I have a meeting agenda form required so I can own fully my participation and not just be there because my name was on the list to attend. What are we doing? Ownership. So I push it with clear agreement. What do you really want? Lots and lots of people uh, experience difficulty in being clear because they don't like conflict. If I'm clear and you don't do it, I got to hold you accountable. So maybe if I just be unclear and hope you'll do it, it'll work out. So you got to be careful if you want to be liked more than you want to be effective. Because if you want to be liked, you're going to back down and be unclear with people. Please like me. You're not doing your job. Let's get clear. <sighs> you know, so really, right through people's careers, they struggle with this, and it gives us a worse work product. What's the next one? Clear roles and authority. People say, I'm held accountable for things I don't have authority for. Well, go ask for it. I'm not going to ask for it. Why not? They might give it to me, and then I'll be accountable. More clarity. 
lots of people working right now unclear on their role, terrified to get clear. Job description different than role clarity. Role clarity in a team environment is essential because it changes lots. So you've got to get that distinction made. So we do a role clarity worksheet. What's the next one? Say it again. Yeah, leadership. Which way? I got people with more than one boss. They do the work of the boss they like. They do the work of the boss that provides the reward. They have matrices and dotted lines, and it's a mess. And so lots of times we have to get very, very clear with leadership. What is the priority? You have limited resources. You're sending mixed messages. Sit in this room. Don't come out till you're clear. Well, I don't know how to get clear. OK, you have one hour or you die. Then they get clear. So unfortunately, it's by crisis. But people really want to perform and be part of something great. Leaders, you have to be clear. What's the next one? Accountability is a learning tool. It's not punishing you. It's simply saying, this is what I did. Here's what I learned. Here's what I'll do differently. Here's how I am accountable for that. So if you worked for me and you said, while you were gone on your trip, I had a conversation with the CEO of XYZ and said, yes, we could change the date. Great. However, you just preempted the meeting I had with the President of the United States. Oh, well, here's what I learned. This is what I did. Here's what I learned. Here's what I do differently. Here's how I'll be accountable for that. So when I answer that way, it's not finger pointing and blame. It's ownership. And so I'm accountable for the results. What's the next one? And we say, just because they know the goal doesn't mean they know what success is. The goal is get to the moon, but our definition of success, Houston, we have a problem, is get them back alive. So the, there, there is a game changer lots of times, even though goals are clear for an organization. That's why that's so important. Make the distinction. What's the next one? No rescue, fix, and save. Biggest problem we've got going on, leaders, I'm your boss. You hand in inferior work to me. I don't hand it back and say, do this again. I fix it and then send it on. And then the economy shifts, and you're no more ready to go out and get a better job because I've been rescue fixing and saving and getting paid for that. Instead of saying, this is not acceptable. It isn't what we agreed to. Do it again. I hate you. You're mean. Yeah, OK. I like me. And what's your point? Because this isn't doing anybody any favors. Folks, I've got all kinds of people moving on in the succession plan. The baby boomers retiring. The people behind them not ready because they've been rescued, fixed, and saved in the quality of their work. Does that make sense to you? It's not acceptable. Get good at holding people accountable because you hold yourself accountable. If you're getting paid to be liked, then congratulations. But it isn't going to last. What's the next one? That, that was what we just talked about. You got to do it. Be clear. If you're not clear, ask clarifying questions. And they might say, boy, the other people don't get so clear. I just want to own this fully. I'm not asking because it's an intelligence issue. It's because I am not clear. And I got to tell you something. If someone isn't being clear with you, it's usually one of two reasons. They don't understand it themselves, or they don't want you to understand. There is no reason to not keep asking until you're clear for full, for full ownership. So it isn't you. It's not an intelligence issue. It really is they don't understand it themselves and they're feeling a little caught or they don't want you to be clear. It's only one of those two things. So it's OK to say, I didn't get that at all. Then keep asking. So let me ask a clarifying question. I want to own this. What's the next one? Conflict competent, yeah, be good at. Go, take as many classes as you can on conflict competence. And I'd actually now add something, cultural competence. Cultural competence and mutual respect. Our disciplines are going to be different, and that's a culture. A physician's culture is different than a nurse's, is different than a, 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 a core tech or a, a hospital administrator. I have to teach those cultures to get along. Not race, gender, ethnicity as much as discipline differences. So financial discipline is often at war with you know, the, the uh, softer social skill kind of things. It's, to them, it's black and white. It's a culture. It's not right or wrong. We need all of it. So conflict competence and cultural competence. And what's the final one? Transparent. 
I'll let you see what I'm doing. It's on my calendar. I don't have big long to-do lists. I have everything in time. And that's a tool called living in now. So you can see you're one human being, you're using your time well. So I have the company, the leadership rating. And right now, many don't get past an aggregate of three. They need to be at five to even have me come in and start talking about personal accountability. They're not even well managed yet. When you interview for a job, see how many of these qualities they have for you to do what you want to be doing. This is who I am. This is who you're getting. Here are the behaviors. Those are the 11 things I wanted you to remember. That's what we create in a culture that is accountable in a work environment, in a committee environment, in a, any environment, that this is what you can expect of me. I'll be clear. Well, I kind of liked it when you were, there's a, there's a movie called Big and the guy doesn't know any better and he goes in and he starts working really hard and the guy next to him says, slow down, you're making the rest of us look bad. Because it's a culture of, it's, it's good enough. If you settle for that, then you're going to get what you get. You got to go for high performance accountability. I'm responsible, self-empowered, and accountable for understanding the role, the task, and the final deliverable and due dates. It's up to me to be clear and successful in my role. If obstacles or conflicting priorities arise, still up to me to get the focus. No fault, no blame, no guilt. That's the label. No fault, no blame, no guilt. What's personal responsibility? How you think before you do something. No law, no rule, no anything says you're going to work with 100, 0, 50, 50. You decide that. Don't you ever let somebody tell you that arrow is not there. Give it context. I live at 100, 0, and I can recognize when I'm not dealing with that, and I do the appropriate thing. It's not that you should be there or not, then I'm just shooting on you, and you're in a pile of shit by the time we're done. And everybody's shooting on each other. And then people come into your company and say, what's that smell? It's all the shit. Well, what are you, we're shooting on each other. You should do this. Well, you should have known. Well, you should have asked. Well, you should have told me. It's like, I'm not going to shoot on you. You don't shoot on me. S-H-O-U-L-D. <laughs> so, so you don't want an environment of that. You want as close to that 100 as you can get. We know 85 15 is the magic mark. Society will push back hard. Take responsibility for my own life. Is that even legal? And, and the biggest how to the CEO is all along I thought I was accountable and now I'm learning I haven't been. That's a big hit in their head. And then I have to self-empower, take action and risk to ensure the achievement of the result. It requires risk. I've got to step out. I've got to say, Linda, I want those tools. I'm going to start to use them. That 28-year-old did that. He's using them for everything. He wants me on his board to use them. So he said, I, I'm clear now, and this is risky because as I push people to be clear, it feels a little bit like this. I'm stepping out. This is not age related, it's not experience related, it's self-awareness related. I will take this risk. So you're gonna feel a little bit alone in the process, but that's what leaders do. They say, it's not position, it's mindset, and that this is important. And then I'm going to answer for it. And that risk set, says I have to venture out. A ship in the harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are for. So now I'll answer for it. Whoops. Sorry. Right. I have a Mac. There. <clears throat> OK. Personal accountability after I evaluate. No fault, no blame, no guilt. This is not personal accountability. Will you tell me why you're not the person to be answering for this? You stand in the middle regardless. So the model is simple. I own it, personal responsibility. I act on it, empowerment. And I answer for it, accountability. Own it, act on it, answer for it. I own it. Hang up and drive. Don't text and drive. I act on it. Never do it. And I answer for it. I have accident-free driving and I'm aware of what's going on around me. Clear agreement with myself. Clear agreement with society. Begins there. I'm not wandering around wondering. I had my moments in the desert and now I'm as clear as I've been about what I want to do and who I want to do it with. And everybody wants to know what's next in this economy. It's a new game. It's a whole different world. Get your definition of success clear. Keep looking at yourself. 
Introspection is going to be the winner. Person who knows himself is going to be a tremendous leader, not vulnerable to character assassination because their character is solid. Keep growing. You're going to have to overcome some of your personal barriers to stepping up. So get people around you. I have a coach. I have a mentor. I keep changing them up. The board at the CPT challenged me. These people are extraordinarily successful in their businesses, smart in different ways. Overcome it, take risk. Keep track of what's in the very first box for you, what you believe, because that's going to get your outcome. I believe we can change society with the Center for the Public Trust suit and cha chapters, with you asking a different level of question. I believe it, and I'm going to use time, energy, and effort to push it, to, to champion it, to be a part of it. If I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference, that's not where my time is going to go. Or when you're in deep trouble, say nothing and try to look inconspicuous. Hard to see, but there's a fox right in the middle of the group looking the same way. It's not about going underground. It's about standing out. So make sure that you stay developed. You're a kind of flower or plant. Way to grow covers this information. You want to make sure you know which you are. Weed is the lowest maintenance. That's what you want. Be a weed. I'm going to say low maintenance and grow. Daisy, I'm going to have to coach you, but know when you come into my company, I'm going to identify that and make sure you get the coaching you need. Or Orchid, I need steam. It's too hot. Where's my special food? Turn me to the right. It's not hitting me. Just they suck you dry. They're high maintenance, but they're pretty. And people are like, just pass them around the organization and hope somebody takes them. You don't want to be in babysitter university. Most managers feel like babysitters. Did you know that? They feel like babysitters because people don't step up to their personal accountability and clarity. I don't want to take this job to babysit. I want to take it to be a difference. So no, you don't want to go there. You want to make sure you're in this model, responsibility, empowerment, and accountability. Some days all you can do is smile and wait for some kind soul to pull your rear end out of the bind you got yourself into. And usually you got yourself into that bind by not being personally accountable at the get-go. So you recalibrate, get great ideas from this conference, but do not do this. Do not go back to everybody after this day and a half or two days and go, I learned some great stuff you should use. Then the person going, oh man, have you been to a conference? You're going to make me read a book. You're going to you know, look up the website, go to the YouTube thing. Leave me alone. You take everything you're learning in this really amazing uh, conference that I've seen the whole agenda for, you're going to get amazing stuff. Apply it right here. And if you're willing to do that, it's going to be a no-brainer who's going to get picked to do what. Future is totally yours. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now, oh, you can ask me questions. Yeah, because it's 10.30, right? I didn't want to just have you hanging on. Now you can ask me questions. Can't they? Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, it takes them a little time. They're, sh they're shocked. They're stunned <laughs> into silence. I've been everywhere. I've done everything. It's your chance. What do you want to know? Yes, April. Oh, oh, wow. Isn't that <laughs> good? <laughs> um, I'm in a leadership position where I have a lot of people who I work with um, who do a lot of the talking about and not talking to. And I've been trying to encourage them. And I'm, yes, I'm blaming right now, but I'm just trying to figure out how to solve this problem. Um, and I've, been, I've tried encouraging, encouraging them to tell me, you know, if you have a problem, let me know please, like we can work it out, and they've gotten a lot better about it, but I find there's still a couple people who, um, you know, it's like we sit in a meeting and they say nothing for two hours, and the next three days I get a phone call from someone saying, well, so-and-so said this, and so I should I tell you because she doesn't want to tell you, and is that a problem with me being approachable? I'm very, very talkative. I can be really scary, or is it a problem with... Um, you know, communication, or is it just, is there a way to kind of inspire them to be more vocal, or is, there, is that just kind of like an unchangeable, stagnant type of thing? All right, so let me make sure I parse this out so I'm clear about the, the questions, because this exact thing, you could be the vice president of a company right now saying this exact thing. Do you believe me about that? 
absolutely no difference between what you're experiencing right now and the question I get asked at that level. So one part of it is, why don't you tell me directly? I'm just, I'm calling you Peyton because, you know, the person's afraid to tell you this, but, you know, you really need to know this. So I'm, I, I'm probably going to get some really good feedback right now. Why is it, before you tell me what you think is so important this person pass on, I'm not told directly. So I'm going to use that person as a resource. Could you give me some feedback? Am I scary? Do I shut you down after the first sentence before you even have a chance to say it? Well, eight years ago, when I tried to talk to you, you know, you did this. Good to know. Now, before you tell me what you think you need to tell me, I'm actually just going to call the person directly. Oh, no, don't do that. Then they'll never trust me again. Yeah. Then yeah. I'm not comfortable with this conversation. I prefer, you have to have some courage to say that. The two words that I alluded to in the description, you're going to learn two words. Remember the 11 behaviors I showed you? You're scoring those. The two words, it's on a big pink card in my office. You go in my office, there it is, because it requires this all the time every day. Be brave. Be brave. You got to stop for a second and say, it's not okay with me to pass it on. I'd be happy to learn why I'm not approached directly, because I need to know this. And I might cry, so I'll bring my own Kleenex, but I want to know, and, and now I'm going to talk to that person directly. That's one thing. All right, now let's go to the next box. The next box is you're with people and they're talking about someone that's not there. And you say, I need to stop this right now because I'm getting uncomfortable. Let me go get the person so they can hear this too. You think that would shut? So your eyes went, whoa. <laughs> Let me go get them so they can hear this too. Now, if you're going to be doing stuff like that, it's like having the bumper sticker on your car. It's like, I'm going to announce it. I don't do this you're going to get left out of every grapevine there is, <laughs> and you're going to become the subject of the grapevine. It's great fun if you're willing to, you know, be the, the, there's always an element to something that's getting passed around, so okay. All right, so I'm going to say I'm uncomfortable because that person isn't here. So at the very least, I'm going to just dismiss myself. You know, we're talking about someone who's not here. Can I go get them so they can hear this too, or maybe I just need to dismiss myself? This isn't appropriate. So the final box is you're going to be a huge winner in effectiveness if you can use the word I more than the word you. You need to stop talking about other people. It's really causing a problem. I'm uncomfortable and I'm getting really concerned because there's a lack of direct conversation. Right? The second you say you, defenses go up. You know, my husband says to me, you know, you need to really work on your attitude. I say, thank you so much. Wow. Yeah, let me do that for you. Not. <laughs> you know, it's a fight. It's a you are doing something that's impacting me versus saying, in a professional environment in particular, with committees, as the leader of something, I have a concern. I'm frustrated because I thought our agreement was we come to these meetings prepared and on time and that's not happening. Did I misunderstand? I want feedback. You have a euectomy. Have a euectomy. Just get it out of your now. <laughs> you, you can remove that. You're gonna and I'm having the, per, performing that procedure on lots of CEOs right now. However, there is a time to use you when you are the manager with authority and someone is not performing and their job is at stake. You'll hear me say this. You need to understand. You are on a performance improvement plan. You have two more opportunities to make this right. And if that does not happen, there is a consequence. And the consequence is you are no longer employed. But if I use I, I'm wondering how you're feeling about 8 o'clock as a start time. And I think maybe I haven't been clear about No, I'm going to say 8 and after 8 is late. And you need to understand that or you are not here. There are non-negotiables. So I have two hats I'm wearing. The collegial leader hat that says you're a peer. I don't have authority over you. You are a colleague. This is volunteer work. I'm going to express lots of I. I'm going to enroll. When it's you and I'm managing and this has to be done, you're going to hear you. Do you see the distinction? Use when you're the boss. Use when you're the mom. It's so cool. You need to know 
this is how it's going to be. <laughs> if it doesn't work, it work. It doesn't even work at home that much, but you know, you could try. So the, the, the process, that there's so much to the, the uh, way that we get work done that a lot of it is you have to enroll people in the relationship and you're starting to get uncomfortable. Own the discomfort, use an I message, and ask for feedback as often as possible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So try it, but you've got to put, it, put yourself in there and say, I'm uncomfortable and here's why. And often if you could do it after the fact, so you go to the person and say, a couple of times I've had an experience where I'm being told something that someone else has said. I want to know if we can make a new agreement about how to handle that because I'm getting really uncomfortable with it. When you do it not at the time, they can hear you much better and they start to change their behavior. But you get no wiggle room in doing it with other people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You've got to be clean about it. Can't mandate it, only demonstrate it. That was a great question. Did it answer it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I love questions. Yes. No. You kind of Noel. Really, um, answer this a little bit because I'm thinking about if you're in a marriage position, you have someone that's not performing, but um, this is a different as a student, if you have a leadership position over someone else, you can't really fire them. Oh. You can't fire you. them. Right. And so. How would you handle, and, and this is a situation for me right now, in fact, I have a meeting with this person next Monday. Um, how, would, how would you say I could handle that same, like, you know, I can't say you need to do this or else I'm firing you because it's like, well, everyone voted for you and I can't fire you. <laughs> yeah, it's like I didn't pick you. Let's right. start there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so, um, but how would you say that I could address that differently then and still kind of say something as far as you do need to do this like and kind of one thing that stood out to me that you said was when you said it's not a position it's a mindset and I feel like with that person they see it as just that's their position but they don't take the initiative in their position whereas other people in my leadership team I don't have to tell them anything. I mean, they, because I'm the president of the organization, they do it and they tell me, what do you want me to do? What do I need to do? And this particular person never asks. And if I don't tell them directly, if I don't babysit them, it doesn't get done. And so how would you say that I would kind of um, approach that, being that I can't necessarily give a huge consequence, you know? I mean, the, only, you. You know, the only possible I consequence pain. I could be is like, you know, I'm going to tell everyone not to vote for you next year or something. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but so that would be gossip. I'll provide an answer, but I'd love your feedback as well. Okay. I'd like, you know, we've all dealt with this in some form, I'm sure, especially if we, we are in volunteer organizations. Thank you. I would suspect it's a role clarity issue. And to, to read the purpose of this meeting is to revisit role clarity. And I'm doing it with everyone. So because these things are not happening, I know it's probably because I wasn't clear. I want you to notice I make myself the problem, not from a, you know, ah, gosh, gee whiz, false way, but really it's probably because I wasn't clear. And in order for this to work, all these rules have to be uh, done. And I'm totally understanding if someone can't do something because family situation, school workload change. So, can I talk about how these things can get done? Because I'm talking about the role, not the person, right? You got to be careful. It's very difficult to be non-judgmental. Very difficult because it'll come across in tone and otherwise. Why really am I having this meeting? I'm having it to be clear or to make you understand I'm pretty ticked off right now and I need you to behave. You know, really you've got to get clear. It's called intention. What's your intention? And my intention is to explore why these things are not happening, is there something I can do, up to and including they're never going to happen, and walk away with no judgment about that, but sit down and parse it out so it, get, it happens. But you've got to get to a place of no judgmentalness because you also don't have that role either. They, they did what they did and they'll always potentially get by that way we see it in political office all day every day. They're doing other things. And it's not the work that they signed on for, that we voted for them to do. Okay, great. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. I would say you don't want to do that thing because, again, put yourself in their position. So I would say 
I'm having this meeting with everybody so I'm sure that I understand role clarity. I'm thinking it's because I w it wasn't clear to begin with. And so I just wanted to reset, is this what's expected? That you attend this many meetings, that you're on time for them, that these duties are done. And I, let's just look at it. Maybe I need to get clarification. With no thought of other than just getting to a place, not a solution. Does that make sense? Just get to a place. Because you know what? People walk away from those conversations going, OK, she didn't make me wrong. I'm not in trouble. Uh, I think I'm caught in not doing what I agreed to do. And they think about it. I would try to walk out with a clear agreement. So can we agree going forward, if anything that's in your assignment isn't going to happen, that I get contacted? So your goal really is make nobody wrong in the process. Does that make sense? And I do have a role clarity sheet you can look at just to help you prompt for all of your team that's doing this voluntarily. Just Linda at lindagalinda.com. Send me your tools and look through them and see which ones are going to help you. In writing, noting things, and be sure you never talk about her negatively to anybody else. And I know that's tempting. To slow it down, get to a place, not a solution, come out with a little baby clear agreement out of it. And some people you do have to babysit their entire lives. How many times do I hear this? They're so good at what they do, but they have terrible interpersonal skills. So they've got crummy morale in exchange for someone who's skilled. And people say, let them go. We'll, we'll work short. We'll cover it. We'll do anything. We won't complain. But we don't want that attitude around us. It's our environment, too. So they'll parse it out. And your job is make, don't make them wrong. You're welcome. I know there's a peop some people that got an A on a subject they didn't even participate in because the group wanted the A more than they did. You ever been in one of those? And you know, you could talk about them all you want, but then when you're the employer and they come and interview for you to, for the job, you just start saying, no, no, it shows up. Although I can't fault that person. They're getting a good ride for very little work. Score, got a good team. Yes? Okay. Um, you talked about you know, activities not equaling results. Probably the biggest offender of that right here. I'm so like, on a day, thank you, on a day to day ah. basis, you know, I wake up and I'm like, okay, I have this and this and this, I have my planner, and then I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to walk here, and this meeting, this class, and da, da 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 And I'm always just like in the mindset of like, oh my gosh, I'm so busy. And I have problems some days because the end of the day, I mean, you're laughing because you know it's so true because totally happens. I have a daughter happens. like this. Not that Not one. Not that one. Okay. Not that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, how do you, this sounds like a really simple question, but, like, how do you achieve those results? How, at the end of the day, how do you look at everything that you've done in the day? How do you look at all of your projects and all of your agendas and all of your, um, you know, the to-do list? And how do you take that from being busy and having a lot of things to try and accomplish to actually, at the end of the day, not even prioritizing, but just actually making those. This is going to be a good answer, I can tell. You think about this Can't one. wait. All right. <laughs> so your, uh, your experienced professional world six-figure person corollary is they have Velcro here and here in the company, and they're like this all day. <laughs> and people go, what? What? Can we have it? No, I'm fine. Well, no, really. I have a way you can. I can don't know. It'll be OK. All right. It's the heroics of a lot, a lot, a lot. Here's the first thing I coach. You are not allowed to have a to-do list. I would take it away. Oh. See, look, she's having withdrawal already. <laughs> not allowed. You have a high activity need. So just like breathing, the second you get focused and it's calm and straight, you're, something starts knocking, hello, move. Oh, blinky. Oh, look at that. Oh, ooh, phone. Oh, email. Oh, and it, you know, it's, it's, I, if I don't respond to that, I'm going to die. It's a high activity need. So there's some people with a high activity need. There's other people opposite high thought need. Two of you sitting, I say the same thing, boom, you're gone. What's she doing? I have no idea. She's <laughs> going to do something. He's saying, what are you doing, Jay? I'm thinking about it. He's thinking through. This. She just gets going. High activity need. So one, no to do list allowed. Two, you must have a physical activity outside of school, work, and everything else that is purely physical. Bike, run, bowl, hunt, fish, whatever, shop. I don't know what you people do. But <laughs> go, 
do something active because then when you have to say to your mind, sit and focus, it doesn't feel like you're depriving it of the air it needs, which is lots of activity. If you handle that activity need outside of the need to focus and do quality work and handle things, then you'll be able to calm yourself down. I have a timer because I get easily distracted. I have a high activity need. And I say, if you will stay on this 20 minutes longer, when someone says, got a minute, or the thing goes off, no, Linda, stay on this 20 minutes more for the board report, for the this or that, then you can get up. It retrains your stress response. You lower your stress by having more to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have a to-do list. Well, what do I do? You have to put your time in your calendar. When you say yes to someone, there it is, and you say, look, I have 3 a.m. right here on Thursday for that. See, pretty soon you start to see everybody has the same limit, which is what? 24 hours in a day. And then when I, you interrupt me, I'll say, you know what? I'm going to meet with you, but today at 3, because I'm on focus. And there's big blank spaces for me to have the freedom to do other things. But it's not so tightly scheduled. Your mind has completely lost track of what you're capable of doing in a day. God bless youth, but it will catch up with you. You've got, well, 30 years yet. But I can tell you, executives carry that forward into their life, and they're constantly over committing and overdoing, and it's irresponsible. The quality of their work is crap because they've got too much. And they just have a lot going on, which they equate with being successful. It's not. At the end of the day, you complete each day completely. You give everything a home. You might have collected a couple of things to get done. And you put them in their home and their calendar. And you go off and have the social life. You have you know stuff you didn't anticipate, all of that. But you must give up the to-do list. And you must get active in what you're doing. I'm coaching this like crazy right now in corporate work because people are overworked, but really they're overcommitted. They could say to their boss, I need input. Here's the data, not I'm busy. And then the boss comes and says, well, now I want you to take care of this. OK, in addition to everything else, or does something come off? No, you got to pile it in. Well, what happened to the last person in my job? They're not here anymore. Yeah, I know that. What happened to them exactly? They're dead. I guess they weren't that committed. What? No, really, it will, it will eat you alive. And it also sets a terrible example for people you're trying to lead to say, I expect this result with your full attention, and I'm not going to let you use overcommitted as an excuse for poor quality of work. I'm not doing it. And people are terrified to produce work without all the barriers, to see that maybe it wasn't that good to begin with. How many of you like to procrastinate assignments and the adrenaline, adrenaline rush gets you through to get it done. Come on. Yeah, you got to start giving that up now. <laughs> because you got to really see what happens when, just not every time, but more often, you're starting to move to focus work and see what, you really, what happens. It's incredible. And you become highly desirable as employees. Because we know you're, you can push to the end in a sprint, but we want to know you can carry the marathon, too. So I always ask people in interviews, tell me how you keep track of time and what you're doing. And if it's not in time, and I'll show you my calendar. You know where I am and what I'm doing. My staff knows so that they can see how to book me and not overcommit. Complete each day completely. That assignment is called Living in the Now. If you email, I'll send it to you. It's two pages. And you clean your closet, we call it. Okay. Good for you for getting lots done. And usually we get overtime out of you for free at companies because <laughs> you're just so busy going, oh, i got to stay late. Cool. You're not going to pay anymore. Who cares? Anybody I think, else? I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, one more. Cornelius. I love your name. Cornelius Lloyd. That sounds like a clothing brand. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> Come see me. <laughs> um, I work in the accounting field. Uh, I work for a very small financial consulting firm. So I work with uh, people from all different ranges of you know, job fields. So uh, my question, I really have two questions. First being, do you believe that cultural competence is the key to having strong relationships with your clients? And then uh, two, what techniques or skills you know, can you learn or build to have a stronger cultural competence? Okay, do I think it's uh, 
important to have a relationship with your clients and your colleagues, it's, it's up there in the top three for me, the cultural competence and mutual respect. Everybody's necessary in this process. So position has nothing to do with value. It's roles we play, client to customer to, to peers and colleagues. And so 90% of cultural competence is awareness. This person's a different age than me. This person is a different race, gender, or ethnicity than me. This person has a different discipline than I do in terms of where they went to school. I guarantee you, if you just turn on that, turn up that volume of the thoughts you're having, then you can pay attention. I say, be interested more than interesting. That's a Covey-ism and it's borne out to be the case. So I work with uh, a nuclear reactor facility where it's all engineers, 200 of them. And I walk in and you want to, you know, the volume goes up for them about, it's a girl. She's going to teach us soft, squishy stuff that we don't really need. But the, the problem they're having is with the culture coming behind them, younger by about 15 years as they move out. The culture's been rescue, fix, and save their performance instead of get them ready to take our place because create not being needed. So there isn't a right and wrong. This is the phrase I want you to memorize to be culturally competent and then just start reading your brains out. Google cultural competence and mutual respect and, and find things and start becoming aware because it is not race, gender, and ethnicity differences primarily. It's just understanding and being aware. Um, but what was I going to tell you? Uh, what was I saying just before that? Google. Uh, say it again? Yeah, the phrase. Thank you. Equally valid and different. Equally valid and different. Equally valid and different. Both and. If you think right and wrong, now, this is important. It's, it's actually an extraordinarily good point. That when you get into transactional accountability, the law, Non-negotiable, right, wrong, easy. Over here, there's a hundred ways to the same thing. So you've got to say, just because I might sit down with you at the get-go, I'm a little afraid of you because you're younger and smarter and faster and brighter, and you might be afraid of me because I'm older, not old, older and experienced and, and written books and stuff. We start up with that versus saying, what really can I, what, what is the thing we have in common we want to solve? And the way you do it may get us the same place way out of my comfort zone. When I went back to school, I said, okay, what textbooks do I buy? There are no textbooks. What? Yeah. And you need a Mac. A what? I'm on a PC. All this change, but it's, this, it's a different way of the same place. It's a different way of the same place. Both and equally valid and different. So I can, last question, leave you with an example of this that I learned from my husband and he continually teaches me with funny things he does, but this one in particular. We got married, we combined our households, and the, we divided the chores of the house. And you do things certain ways. You grow up doing things certain ways, so one of them was mowing the lawn. First day of our marriage weekend, I said, I'll go mow the lawn, and I'm out there two minutes, and he runs out. And I'm like, what? And he goes, turn the mower off. What, what, what? And he says, that's not how you mow a lawn. And I said, excuse me? He said, Linda? Rows, you need rows. You gotta, you know, start down the track and then turn to the right. And I said, stop, 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 stop. Your definition of success and mine appear to be different for mowing lawn. Here's mine. Blade hits grass, order in which that occurs, unimportant. All shorter when I'm done. That's my definition of success. So we're focused now both on the same thing, shorter lawn. But he has an order. And then he starts acting like, it's gotta be done this way. And I'm like, why? Do planes land according to the lines in the line? What, what, is, the, what is the thing that happens if it's squeaky? Look at Rick's lawn. Look at Rick. See how nice? I say, yeah, he's anal. What difference does it make? Scale of who cares? Go away. My turn here. I'm doing short lawn. Your turn. Have lines. Three days later, I'm in the living room. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm folding these towels. He said, didn't I see the girls fold these earlier? Yeah, but they weren't folded right. Excuse me? I said, Mike, fold in threes. Fold in threes, they go in the towel closet. It's all, it works, you see inventory, some nosy person sees the, the tea. He said, really? 
because his definition was towel door closes. And he said, I have one word for you. And I said, what? And he said, lawn. <laughs> so I want you to notice as you're coming up in your education, in the jobs you accept, and the people you work with, you have a way of doing things, and so do they. Gen X and Jerry X are starting to collide big time. <laughs> you got to get clear on whether it's how or what. Is how I'm doing this the problem or whether I can do this? Whether is skill, how is style. And then what is the non-negotiable here? So it's a human being with differences and we come at it differently. And the more we understand that and look at driving for the common result and we get really clear on the what, then we can use all the difference to get there. That's what our opportunity is. Tough to do, turn the volume up. It's not out of a book, I promise you. It's out of paying attention and being human. I could do this all day long, but you have amazing things ahead of you. So again, thank you very much for your time.